So you can hear me, you can see my screen, you can see there's a slide up right now. Yeah, we can see the sign. Perfect. Okay, just want to make sure. All right. I heard a lot of sound, so I'm just trying to figure out where it's coming from. There's just background sound. <clears throat> All right, so if there's no particular questions, again, we're going to start out with the top 20 security controls. And again, look at that for a while, and then we'll move on to uh, you know, CPTE. If you have any questions, feel free to jump in. If you want to use the chat window, that works beautifully as well. What's nice about the chat window is, you know, if you just want to like add a comment, I'm talking, and you don't want to jump in, you can always, you know, do so. All right. Has anybody done either uh, any certification test as of yet? And did it go pretty well for you? Very, very quiet group we have here. <laughs> Hopefully everything's going well for you. And after we're done, I hope you have a fantastic weekend, of course. So, um, all right, so it sounds like you guys are okay able to hear me. Let me know if you have any trouble. Okay, I'll go ahead and start then. Okay, cool. All right, so got some that have done CSS, CVA. There's um, at some point you guys might do um, you know, all right, good. I'm getting some feedback. Makes you feel good starting, you kind of knocking out the certifications. You just kind of like just methodically move through them, and you, you know, get it accomplished. All right. All right. So we are looking at top 20 security controls, and it has this is one of those funny chapters. If we'll look at it, you can kind of see. There's actually like 20 sections to it, but they're, they're kind of short. That's what's interesting about this one. So it's one of those that there may not be a lot of writing, but there's a lot we can talk about. So, you know, we're okay, so everybody see, I think we're going pretty much to everybody with this, CSP, CSSO. Yeah, a lot of different certifications here. Anybody going after CISSP, you know, it's usually something we'll, someone will do after they do the CISO, somewhere along the way after they do the CISO test. Uh, I would definitely study study a lot because that's one of those nitpick tests you can just you know you hear people talk about as being kind of a, a scary experience, but it's more of just being prepared. You know, there's a lot of subjects that I prep people to pass. Oh, okay, that one. All right, I prep people to pass in a you know a, a cram sort of situation, but okay, so SSCP that wouldn't be quite as bad. Okay, but if you ever, if you ever decide to do the CSP though. Uh, just kind of put yourself in a study regiment and read. I personally like the Sean Harris book. It's a really thick book. It's kind of hard to read sometimes. But there's other really good ones out there. You can get ratings on like Amazon if you're curious about some uh, you know, additional books you could add. But the CISSP, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, the author, the, the uh, Sean Harris, the Sean Harris has passed away and she was the one that wrote the very noteworthy uh, CISSP uh, book that's out there. And um, hopefully there will be so if her friends are someone who will maintain the book and keep it up to date, because it is up. She's a was a wonderful author, and it's, it's a good resource, absolutely. So it just kind of goes in great depth, you know, into materials that when you want to explore. It may not be one of those books you read from start to finish, but it's one of those you'd look up spot subjects if nothing else. But that's actually what I used uh, when I was prepping. So now this part, though, the uh, looking at our top ten, top twenty security controls. Start out with inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices. Okay, critical control number one. And you sit back and look at these and you go, this makes sense. This is a good thing. And you know, thinking about their controls here, we do have to watch out what we have connected on our network. If you have anything on your network that's not secured, that could present you know, a vulnerability. So devices are not immediately patched or configured with proper security updates. That's true. I think companies are sometimes afraid to patch quickly because they want to go through a thorough testing process and they feel that 
if they patch and they don't test, then it could be have some ill effects. And that's true. <laughs> it is true. We probably need to accelerate our testing, though, and be a little more aggressive with it because it is a danger to have these systems out there and not have them patched. So yeah, because and another thing, see, attackers will use devices to access the network and compromise other systems. I used to think that who cared if a client was weak? You know, because the important computers are the servers. Well, it's true the important computers probably are the servers, but if we can use these little systems, that, these workstations that are not secured very well to kind of pivot or use to get to the servers, then we've messed up. You know, if we have any sort of weak link, that might be, you know, how we get into the, the systems we really want. So it really does matter. That's why you hear sometimes um, network access control, NAC, NAC, and they talk about, if you ever heard about the NAC software, it actually will control, well, if you have a certain standard, a so-called security posture, where you want to be, what operating system, what patch level, what antivirus, and, and so on, and you say this is where everybody must be, and if you have a system that tries to plug in that maybe they've been gone for a couple months and they're not up to date, and they try to plug in, uh, some network access control type software would quarantine them and keep them off your network because they would be a risk to you and they will keep them off the network until they fix their problem and become up to your come up to your standard. So that's it's just really important to have machines where they need to be. And you know Microsoft patches a lot, but probably because they're a big target. You know, you've got to do what you gotta do. So again anybody's just coming in it's a uh, top twenty security controls. We're just looking at the first section here. So, and again, the vulnerable system may not have anything really super critical, but they are the pivot point. They are the gateway that the attacker uses to get to what they truly want. You don't want a weakling there for them to push past. You don't really want, preferably, a Windows XP computer still hanging around because you're not getting any patching. Now, rumor has it from some military types that it sounds like you can, that military may be paying to keep certain systems on XP, paying dearly to uh, keep them patched. Because apparently Microsoft, from what I've heard, may be offering some patching for a cost uh, for the systems that are insisting on staying on XP. But I'm not so sure that's anything I've heard offered to the general public. But perhaps it, it would be something to look into. But it would be better if it could go on and just get into a newer system. And, and because the newer systems are being maintained and they're more secure. <clears throat> and of course here they're talking about to implement a policy that satisfies this control. We have certain requirements. We have to know what we have, our inventory. It's an accurate and up-to-date inventory of our systems, you know, whether they're deployed or not. And we have to kind of keep paying attention and know our systems, know our configuration, know what we have. If we're really aware of our environment, we can have more control over this and you know, keep our systems more secure and not and be aware if there's any systems that are not up to par so we can take care of that and get them patched. Okay. When possible, automated asset inventory tools could be used. Absolutely. For a fee. But um, those are really nice, you know, because it could help you. There may be something out there you didn't even know was there. And you know any sort of automated tools always kind of handy like that. Okay. And so, of course, giving us the administrator the idea of what we have, because we might be in shock once we run the asset inventory tool to see that that's still in use. That was supposed to be disconnected. You know, that kind of mindset. So, of course, it, it goes through and it tries to discover your systems by scanning for network addresses and monitoring traffic and just kind of seeing what's happening there. And what might we care to keep up with? Talks about the actual network address. Generally we're thinking IP address. I mean I think it's important to know a lot about your addresses in general. I mean IP addresses and know what about the specific maybe MAC address, machine name, what the purpose was, that computer there. Maybe who even uses that computer possibly and the department that's responsible for that user is what's being suggested. So if it is a device that gets an IP address, it's really part of your world. And you can just kind of look through some of these and go, yeah, there's a lot of different devices out there.
I'm just checking something real quick, so I'm pausing for just a moment. I was trying to get rid of any background sound that I'm hearing. Okay. All right. So, you know, you think about it, your desktops, laptops, servers, routers, switches, firewalls, printers, storage area networks, voice over IP, I mean, whatever it is. If you think about just what you connect up in your home, I mean, you've got possibly smart TVs, tablets, game systems, computers, I mean, just everything. So we want to have in it a true inventory of what's really there. Now, and automated network asset discovery tools when properly configured well, just basically let us know what's going on. I think that's the main thing. It's going to be monitoring for you because if someone tries to slip in some new device, we're going to find out about it. And we're going to be more up to date on what we truly have, not what we think we had a couple years ago. And if there's something different, we're going to know about it. We're going to get notified. And disable unidentified devices on the network when they are detected. We could have it set up to do that. I still think of the network access control being a really extra nice tool that they're not mentioning at this very moment. But you, if you have your own security posture of where you want to be operating system-wise, updates and antivirus, and something does not comply, you can even push that system off your network as well. So with anything, you don't just do it one time. There's a lot of things that are like living activities or living documents, whatever it happens to be. And you, know, you kind of have to keep up with this. Okay. So we want to have say, maintain effectiveness of the asset database. Integrity contents must be maintained. And so making sure everything is included that you need to include. If you're, as far as protecting the information, you could encrypt the asset information. Have good access control. And, you know, good, and I like the separate secured copies of the database outside the network. Anything you're keeping up with is... It's nice to make sure you put it in a safe place and not always keep it in one place where there might be a loss of that one item and not be able to get to it again. Okay. So and it, it are forming kind of the concept of a database, you know, include with this inventory. And trying to see what we have, what type of systems we have, what's the relationship, why do we need this system with that system and you know who's responsible for this whole thing. And it's recommended, you're going to see this tendency with every chapter, I pretty much say every chapter in here, that whenever they suggest something, they're going to kind of come back and say, you better make sure it's working. We better, like, test it. So a lot of times they'll say, go do something to see what your tool does. You've got, you've got this automated tool. Let's see if it's actually doing what it claims it does. So let's put it through the test. So they're suggesting that administrators actually deploy devices on the network and ensure the system is operating properly as well as knowing the amount of time it takes for that device to be recognized by the tool. So we go like, pretend like we're, you know, someone that shouldn't do something like a user and say, let me go put this, this, uh, this uh, computer on there. Does, will my automated tool recognize it's there? Will it let me know that it's there? Is it doing its job? So that's kind of, again, the tendency for a lot of the recommendations is, is it really doing what it was put in place to do? Okay. And if there is something that's not doing proper, then we need to record that and try to fix it. We also include removal media and the control automation. You could have external hard drives, USB drives, you know, flash drives, for example. You know, anything you can store information, you want to see what your control does with that. Does it even notice? So, you know, it kind of depends on the magnitude we're talking about here when they put these recommendations together. I mean, it could be a super large company or maybe not so much. And they're even saying that your asset discovery systems may require a separate server to be set up to handle the monitoring and administration of the network. So, if it's something that would have to be checked out depending on what tool you purchased and what its capabilities happens to be. So, and sometimes they'll end the chapters and it's not really so much a summary, it's just kind of a continuation of the thought that realize when you put a tool in place, and it is doing you kind of a favor, it is coming back and saying, you know, this is what I'm finding on your network, and we kind of keep it in real time, kind of keep it up to date on what we have on our network. The tool will put a little bit of strain on your network. They're talking about the additional bandwidth strain on the enterprise network because it is doing some actions, it is doing some querying and checking things out, so there will be traffic. Okay. 
And whenever you introduce something new, you just want to make sure that that something new is not pulling your network down too much. Okay? Make sure that it's not interrupting your whole goal, which is good business continuity. Now, do you realize also that there are a lot of portable devices? You know, uh, especially your wireless devices, your tablets. Uh, some people have, you, know, you can connect a phone to a network. I mean, it is a little computer, basically. Notebooks, laptops, whatever they may be, and they come and go. So that would be, it would be more difficult, but it's something to take into consideration when you're tracking on the inventory. When you see a laptop show up and it disappears and it shows back up, just realize it's portable. Okay. And remote and virtual machines will need to be inventoried carefully too. You know, because people might connect in remotely. Virtual machines are like operating systems running on one physical machine. So it's not like you have five physical machines. You could actually have one physical machine with five virtuals running on there. And if I had a physical machine with five virtual machines running on top of it, that would literally make six because the five virtuals and the one host operating system that you would have. Okay. Do you have questions on this section? All right. Keep going with some controls. Do let me know if you need anything. Okay. And of course you can always talk or you can just use a chat window. Now here they're talking about, he starts out with a lot of inventories with this inventory of authorized and unauthorized software. And these are really good standard, you know, controls to be looking at. So control number two. And you got to think like a hacker, I guess, in a certain way. And a lot of times you're going to see your tests not use the word hacker. Your tests will a lot of times say attacker. Now, the reason being, I think, is, and this is not just a multi thing, they all seem to think this way. They don't want you to think that all hackers are bad. Okay? I mean, hackers can be ethical. So they try to use the word in a lot of the academic areas. They like to use the word attackers. And the catch is, you know, in the real world, if we were listening on the news about someone who hacked into the network, you, you would end up hearing hacker because, you know, they know the public would understand that. So, but just, just interchangeably, hackers, attackers, that's where they're coming from. And I think they're mostly thinking ill intent type, like black hats possibly here. So they're, they're looking, they're going to scan your systems. That's one of the first steps anyway, to see what you have and what you're running. You might actually have some software that's not too secure. And of course they may look through any of these, commercial or open source, web pages, documents, media files, anything that might be considered an opportunity to get in. Okay. So, so when end users access these compromised programs or websites, the computer attackers can gain complete access to both the system and network. So if one of your users managed to get on a website that infected them, you know, from a web page, they could have a possibly a virus or a worm or a Trojan horse type program on their computer and then the hackers literally just port scanning, looking to see what you're running, going, aha, they've got such and such Trojan on their system. I'm going to try to connect. And you're thinking how they get the Trojan. Well, any of this could have been clicking on a website, going to a website, and you can actually go to a website and look at it for a, you know, a moment or so and go, oh, I don't want to be here, and it may be too late. It may have already done a so-called drive-by download where the virus has just come down to your system already. I've seen that happen. I've experienced it. We'll rephrase that. But then, you know, it could have been something the user did also. They could have been playing around with those peer-to-peer -peer websites like the, you know, the Pirate Bay you used to hear about a lot, maybe. And when you download, you know, programs that you normally have to pay for, download movies and different things that you normally have to pay for, a lot of times they come in with an infection, like a Trojan. And a Trojan gives people a backdoor access. So attackers, they're looking for this. They're figuring, I think they're figuring, that there's enough people out there that are kind of reckless with their browsing. It didn't go, we're not being very careful with it, and there's likelihood that they got infected. And maybe these same users, Maybe they thought they were careful, but they didn't have a really good solid antivirus on their system or they didn't keep it up to date worse yet. 
So I don't know, has anybody ever experienced going to a website and just suddenly realizing a virus came down to your system? Or maybe you've downloaded something and realized it was infected later? Feel free to put it in the chat window or speak it either way. I have. And it's not like, you know, I was necessarily on a bad site. I looked at RVs before. I've looked up educational things for class. It, it happens. <laughs> you know, it's not like you're going, I better not say anything because that means I've been playing on Pirate Bay or something like that. No, it just means you used a computer and you're on the internet and things happen. Okay? Yeah, it's true. I mean, you know the reason I figured out I was infected? I, I say infected. I really, my antivirus took care of it. I just got really bored one day and started reading my antivirus log. And I read it and I went, oh, really? A virus tried to come down, and gosh, my AVG antivirus at the time killed it. So good. <laughs> there was no ill effects. But it was just like, really, that happened. So, let me see what you got this. I like this. Pretty good. I guess you guys are seeing everything. I've seen that everything you type is probably, well, it looks like you can um, send it to individuals or everybody. It looks like these are guys. What do you think of that? Those that know they've been hacked and those who know don't know they've been hacked, so yeah, there's a good chance you know, a lot of people aren't aware that someone perhaps has gotten into their system. You know, it's something we really have to watch. Okay, so we have to be very diligent, I think, uh, with us and making sure that we we know what's on our system because we don't want them to find the vulnerabilities in our system. You know, we try not to run anything unnecessary. You know, we want to reduce your attack surface is how what we usually say. And but you just don't want anybody to, you know, make use of that. Let's see. Okay. So, Got to keep it patched, and that's the idea. I mean, this, at the same time, you can be as diligent as possible, and still something could happen. Because realize, uh, it may not be that you are sloppy. It may be just that there is a new attack. Somebody's got to get attacked initially for us to discover that there, you know, that there was a problem. You know, like, hey, they found a way in. We better create a countermeasure for that. We better create a patch for that. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of just simply being sloppy. Sometimes an exploit is via an unknown vulnerability, but often software is unpatched and poorly managed. Oh, yeah. It can depend on users to be sloppy. It's, it's an easy enough thing to do. Okay, so, you know, the emphasis here is software, software that's on your system. So we're talking about inventory and control over what's on your computer. Actually, I've seen some books mention the concept of whitelisting, which just basically means just put on there what you want to have on there, and anything that's outside your so-called whitelist of software is disallowed, versus trying to think of all the ways, all the things to block. Just think of what's allowed, and you know everything else is blocked. That would be would be really better, okay. And if a system's been compromised, I mean, we can lose money, we can lose, you know, lose reputation. You know, we look bad. You know, think about some of the companies you've heard in the news that have been hacked in some way. We hear about it, and perhaps we stay clear of them. You know. Then a control implementation. Continuing with that, you know, we, we'd have to create a list of authorized software that is required for each device in the enterprise, and hopefully stay to that and say that's what you run. You don't run anything else. You don't think people are always wise with software. I mean, I've heard people talk to me and tell me that they they found uh, like computer games put on systems that were at the power company, and, and luckily they were not systems that ran the power. But still, you know, what were they thinking? You start bringing in something that's unauthorized, you don't even know if it's got some sort of infection, a backdoor, that some hacker might find a way to connect into you and then mess things up a lot. Okay? So, and it's anything that could have software on it. I mean, your servers, your laptops, your desktops, your router switches, that's your connectivity, and potentially even printers. Okay? So, I say is a deployment of software inventory tools should also be performed and the ability to track these things. We want to know what you're running. 
the operating system and the version of it, what applications are on your computer, even version numbers of your applications on, on your computer, how well patched you are, you know, where you are on that level-wise. And, and we might even discover some unauthorized software that was put on your computer. Because obviously we don't have good controls, perhaps, if that's the case. Okay? And then really this is what I was talking about, the whitelisting. I mean, that is just so much better. Okay? So much better where you just sort of spell out, this is what we allow. And we don't have to worry about the rest because this is what we allow. Can I play this game? No, this is what we allow. <laughs> and it's not on the list. Okay? Now you could have additional policies that you do other things too, but this is a, such an amazing idea. I really think it's great. Okay? With anything, here we go again. I told you that we kind of have this like ending on most chapters. That, okay, we said the software inventory tool idea was great. Find out what software is running on our computers. To, but what we could do to test is try to mimic what a user might do. And let's attempt to deploy some unauthorized software on these so-called secured systems, these hardened workstations, and just see what happens. Does the tool do what it's supposed to do? Does it let us know? Okay. I say administrators should also configure a program with the specific programs and allow it to be inventory to determine if all installed programs are detected. Yeah, you just got to like testing it. You're saying, would it catch this? Would it catch that? We want to know that it's really working. Okay. And they mentioned some of your endpoint security suites bundled bundle antivirus, anti-malware, firewalls, intrusion detection prevention, intrusion prevention systems, along with the software whitelisting, blacklisting, whitelisting as in what we allow, blacklisting what we disallow. Although if you whitelist everything else is blacklisted, would be, you know, preferable. And, you know, they say endpoint, that usually makes you think of the final devices like the servers, the workstations, which include, you know, desktops, laptops, and so on. And it's a nice idea when you get them to do the bundle approach, I suppose, because you may you may have bought it because it's just an all-around good security product, not realizing it had some additional features that are kind of handy, like the whitelisting, blacklisting. Okay. And again, it's not always a complete summary, it's just sometimes just additional concepts here with our inventory. It would be beneficial in ensuring there's complete integration protection across the enterprise. Now, the pro these suites could also have something called hashing. You hear that in the cryptography section of various books. You got a pretty good part on that from the CISO course. The um, CPTE, you see it a little, but it's more in the CISO course. And with that, hashing is really good to let you know if the system has good integrity, the system, the software, to make sure there's not been any sort of change to it. The term of program uh, should be authorized on the system because when I had a person I was talking to that they said they used she used hashing a lot because she worked at a casino and you know you got all those game systems and apparently whenever I guess headquarters or something would send them games they had to they send them the games and then they say this is what the hash should be and then when they would receive the games they would calculate the hash right there on the spot to see if the version they received is absolutely perfectly identical to the, you know, the one that they intended on sending us. Make sure it's not been manipulated. If the hashing comes out identical, then we trust it. If it doesn't, we think it's been manipulated. Okay. Also, we mentioned additional controls. Uh, time, you can have restrictions on the time and day that certain programs can run. That's an, kind of another thing to think of. Any thoughts, comments, feel free to make this as interesting as possible. Do you have any thoughts on this, what you think people, what really happens in companies, or any thoughts? Okay. All right. Now they're kind of going to a different angle. We look at some hardware, we looked at some software. Now we're looking at configuration. Secure configuration. <clears throat> For hardware and software that we put on our various systems, such as our laptops, workstations, and our servers, uh, critical control. Number three, oh yeah, default configuration of both hardware and software generally not designed with security in mind. 
Yep, that is true. I mean, a lot of systems originally were built to be friendly. And when you're user friendly, you're not usually secure. They don't seem to work together. There's like really opposed. Okay. So we have to know that we must make these changes. We can't leave it default. So people that do leave this default, uh, you make these systems more weak, more vulnerable. Until we can configure them properly, hopefully the administrator. <laughs> okay. Now to resist or combat these vulnerabilities, I mean there's things that we could do. We could really consider purchasing systems with secure configurations already implemented. And that's an interesting thought. Our deploying pre-configured hardened systems, so we, we could have actually, and we can do anything we want to, it's a really flexible area to remedy this problem. I mean, if we, we could, I'm just kind of thinking of some of the things that people do. Sometimes they'll actually configure a system that's secured and they'll even do an image of it. And once they do some sort of imaging of that system, then they can push that image down to the other systems and make them all the same. Keep, you know, updated configurations as necessary. Track your configurations. Just kind of keep yourself secure. But even if you don't actually buy systems secured, um, then you can make sure they are secured. So, in fact, I just realized I had the chat window, so I couldn't read it. I'm sorry. Um, okay. As soon as I have it scrolled up too high, and I don't see it, um, see everything you've got. Yeah, seeing some. Sorry about that. Okay, I was gonna catch up real quick. Yeah, Sean Harris books. Even if you're back at the third edition, it's still got great value. They're still very helpful. Um, let's see, yeah, I can't download the slides, but you can. Um, a lot of times, Small 2 will make a, like an electronic version available on your login to the MyMall 2. Not that you can download, but that you can access online. And an online version of your actual book, uh, your book actually has the slides in printed form. And the online version, the only thing that was nice about online versions is sometimes you can search for things. As long as they're not in the form of a graphic, you can search for keywords. It gets to be really helpful in some of your more advanced courses when you're trying to find something quickly. Okay. Okay. There was, I see a comment about software restrictions policies. Yeah, so in, the, in that environment, I'm just looking at Scott's here, you, were you doing a, a mix of environment software? Are you were doing like Windows 7 and maybe something older at the time when you first started doing software restrictions? It was Scott here using uh, software restrictions. Okay, well, okay. you may be muted if you're trying to respond, but basically there was uh, there were software restrictions. That's been around in Microsoft for quite a while. There's actually something that's supposed to kind of replace it when you become a pure Windows 7 environment or newer called AppLocker. That's like a lot like software restrictions, but there's huge power in Microsoft land doing software restrictions. So if you have systems that are Windows 7 or older, and with the magic word being or older, <laughs> then you're looking at software restrictions. If you have, I think, Windows 7 or newer, you can probably do something called AppLocker, and it will heavily control what software is on the system. And if you can control what software gets on those systems, you can control, like uh, Scott made this remark also, as you can see, uh, used to have malware issues and it stopped them. Yeah, but you can stop what they're putting on there. I mean, who do you think is helping you get the, the malware on your computer? It's your users. And maybe it's not intentional, but they're perhaps being careless. Okay. XP. Yeah, XP, we had to do that. Root policy was a way to, um, okay, was a way to push these requirements down. But yeah, as you guys get into a pure, you know, as you guys move on, you may already be there. As you move away from XP completely and you're at least at a minimum Windows 7, check out AppWalker. You might like it. Okay. The online version, if it's not there, um, just, I'm scrolling down as well, a little behind, catching up on reading all these things. When you guys log into your MyMall2 and you see everything available there, does it have an electronic version 
of your different courses you're doing. It should be somewhere in the, the menus of once you do the log into my mall too. It's probably where you see your test. It's where you if they if they've given you the online version, that's where it would be there. Where it would be Are the toolbars. Let me just catch up. Okay. What I would do, uh, you would first of all go to uh, my mall too. And I'll just kind of jump out of that. Let's see. I'll just say let's do it a better way. Mall2. I should do it. Mall2. Get fun.com. My Mall2 account portal. Just thinking about it. And if you already have a login, you just put your, your information login and it would have what they've set up for you. If you don't have a login, you would put in your register in here. But what I would do probably before you do that, maybe is check with your point of contact that got you in the class. And because there's a chance some of this may have been done already for you, you just don't have the login for it. But just check with them. But they might just tell you to go register. And know once you're in the system, any classes you've signed up for, you generally get access to an electronic version. Yeah, just do that. How it usually works anyway. Sometimes I've been in classes where they go and set you up ahead of time. Okay, it just kind of depends. All right, so I'll try to do a better job with the chat window. <laughs> I'm still not as used to this program as I need to be. Okay, well, if I miss something, let me know. All right, so I don't know. I've never really seen really a lot of people purchasing pre-configured ones. It's more people put together a perf what they call their perfect image of their standard, you know, secure desktop, and they image it, and then they can push that down, and that's a, you know a good way to go. So if you're going to do the images, you know, you always want to evaluate them, test everything should be tested. So if we're, we're putting together these secured images, it, it seems to go back to something called the change control. Change control board, change control management board, I mean change management, there's all kinds of different words for it, with what settings you're trying to put in place. And an image is not going to be always perfectly up to date, because think about it, patches come out all the time. So you, you would sometimes update your path, your, your images, uh, they set on a frequent basis based on current threat levels and so on. So these could you could find these being updated on a pretty regular basis, because we would like your images to have most everything they need. Okay, and this is good. Your operating system images and the applications that you put on those should be pretty much the same, should be standardized. That would be preferable. And also secured. I mean, there are images out there by some of the big players, you know, like NIST and NSA and so on, that could be, you know, good reference. Okay. Now, we hear, keep hearing that term through security classes about, you know, hardening, hardening the operating system, the applications, the routers, the switches, it's always this. It's basically securing like a hard shell wrapped around the product you're trying to protect. Because you know there's so many wannabe hackers out there. So with this, we would, you know, disable and remove any accounts that are not aren't necessary. You can't necessarily do both. There's some things you may say, well, I want to get rid of the, the guest account. Uh, I don't think you can. So better yet, disable it. If you can't remove the account, if it's, if it's probably more like a default that it came with, the system came with this account, then you may be just stuck with the disabling. If it's something you added and, and decided you didn't need it anymore, you remove it. Services, same concept. I remove if possible, definitely disable it at least. And you may have services running that are not necessary. Okay? And you know, applying patches. Okay. You know, making sure the systems are as up to date as possible when you're building the image. If you find a port is open and you don't need it, you could just simply close that port. Uh, which a lot of times might be turning off that service. And of course, implementing endpoint security measures, intrusion detection systems, firewalls. I and mean, when we do have some security on a per machine basis too, you may actually have some sort of full security product. 
that you have deployed centrally that affects all of the stations. And with that, it may have a lightweight intrusion detection. You may have replaced Microsoft's firewall with your own firewall that might be part of that security product. Just, um, you know, that would be, would be nice. Although Microsoft does have a pretty good firewall possibilities. It depends on how well you configure it. But this is all about trying to get it prepped for the imaging so you have a good image to push down. But, you know, in general, it's like an underlying theme that just will not go away. <laughs> is the fact that when any changes that are required, you've you got to like get it approved. This thing called change management. To get the change management for proper documentation and approval, but you do need the approval. You just don't do things without that. Now, do you find in environments you've worked in that there is a bunch of established, like, it doesn't mean current, so I'm going to leave it really broad. So it could be now, it could be in your past. That way you're not revealing anything sensitive. Uh, did you find in any of those environments you've had to be there methodical about changes that are made and you had to like go through an approval process? Or did you just go make changes and really didn't have to consult anybody? No comment? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just curious what you see out there. Uh, hopefully, you know, we're getting more and more into making sure that we get approval because we don't want to have kind of a chaotic environment not knowing, you know, what we're going to experience from day to day. I mean, you could have people, programmer types, that think what they're doing is a good thing and they didn't test it and all of a sudden things go haywire on you. Okay. Now, if you're or okay, zoom more there. Okay, so you know, organizations with critical needs. You got government entities. You consider purchasing systems with standardized images. You could do that and kind of spell out what you really need and exclude software that would increase the attack surface for hackers and introduce additional vulnerabilities. It's kind of funny. Uh, we were having a discussion today. I'm going to just grab, that's not even the right one. I may have destroyed it. I was hoping I left it there. Sorry, I'm trying to find the one I'm looking for. Not sure. I'm going to just ignore this part. It's a part here somebody gave me. They were talking about backdoors into systems actually earlier today. And it had to do with Lenovo's actually. And it's just, you know, a proof of concept example. And I, I know very little of it because I just literally heard about it today. But it was just kind of talking about that there was, we were talking about backdoors, and Lenovo, just one of those many examples, had put some, you know, part of their just standard software, gave them a backdoor into your system. And then there's all these things out there on how to get it fixed, how to get it off your system. So it's called Superfish. And if you, you wonder, and sit back and think, how many other vendors might be doing something similar. You know, putting all this nifty software on there, some little package by that brand, whoever it happens to be, then maybe they do have a, a backdoor in our system, just kind of like a hacker to have a backdoor in your system. Except these are for the manufacturer purposes, but it makes you wonder if the hacker could find a way to make use of those backdoors that were put in there intentionally by the provider or the, by the the brand that you purchased from. I don't know if you've noticed any of that on your systems before, something like that. Okay. Now, your main images, your so-called master images, they should be stored on, on hardened secure servers. So you basically have these very important images. They're basically saying you need to put them somewhere that's safe. You don't want to put your very important images somewhere that could be corrupted. Okay, you want to make sure that there's, I guess, strict access control and only authorized people have the access to make changes to those images because we don't want something malicious added to the image that could, you know, alter us being secure. Okay. Okay. I like this one. It's pretty good. Store your images on machines not accessible in the network via secure encrypted media. Love encryption. Encryption's good. Uh, maybe something that's not too accessible. Anything to make yourself secure. 
Okay. And so we're pushing the idea of doing these, these images that have got the configurations and as up to date as possible that we really want. And and we want we would be good to evaluate that and see if there's any changes or deviations that have been made to these images. Okay. And really that could be done with hashing. So performed on the system to ensure the file integrity has not been compromised. Well, that would be a big giveaway that something had happened if we started seeing the hashes no longer matching. Does anybody ever use, in your current or past companies, or hear anybody using uh, hashing um, to actually verify if any uh, images or any programs have been modified? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So, you know, there's places, Molly Dallas, yeah, you know, I'm not so sure it's a really popular thing that people do. And I don't know if I've shown you this before. I'll just show you one. Okay. Here I just happen to have one from another class. And the little file, the little program is called MD5SUM. And then you just kind of follow it by the file that you want to look at. And it comes back with a string of letters and numbers. I could do this MD5 sum below 2.txt, and it's different, as you can see. So someone could have sent me over this little hello.txt and told me what the hash should be, and then I could download it, and then I could calculate it and see if I come up with the exact same hash. And if I do, I can verify the integrity. And I feel, you know, like, okay, this has not been manipulated. I think I'd go ahead and use what they've sent over to me. And, you know, with this hashing and everything, you can also, you know, that there's a lot, there's some programs out there, it's not so much for Windows people, but there are some, and, okay, let's catch up on this, yeah, all kinds of usage, you know, there's ways you can go with it, I mean, like, um, this one, I'm going to catch up on the chat window in a second, this program here, a little hacking tool, uh, can enable, if you're going to use it, you need to use on one without an antivirus, probably a virtual machine because he's not going to like this program, or make an exception. And with this, it's going to say, here's the program, here's the MD5 hash. You download it, calculate it, make sure it's the same, or a little better one called SHA-1. Okay, so you can catch up on hash, catch on the chat window. Yeah, hashing is used in digital forensics, absolutely, to confirm that the duplicate hard drive is the same as the original. We go to court. Yeah, it's all about proving your obtained data has not been modified. That's spot on. And so it's a compromised version of Putty. Wow, that's, that just makes you feel good. Okay. Yeah, so if you could run the hash, at least, you know, if Windows systems would get a little more adamant about when they offer a program, say, this is what the hash should be. And maybe we would get in a better habit of actually calculating it. You know, you know it's not fewer, maybe, those of you that are Linux types, you're probably really used to hashing. It's kind of a, a normal operation. But Windows people, I'll admit, they don't see it that much. We don't think about it, probably. There's just so many few, there's so few places that I've been where I see, remember seeing, here's the program and here's the hash. I'm going to pull this up so I can see them in front of me. Um, I know, did you love it? 11. So basically, it's secure configuration for hardware and software on laptops, workstations, and servers. That's what we're looking for. That's actually the title of the chapter. Okay. Okay, see where I was. <laughs> I jumped too far. Okay, so we looked at that, and so we know about making them secure, and also I can sure that it's either encrypted or a safe place. We're pretty good on that. And just making sure there's no deviations. That's how we got into the hashing a bit and all about this integrity, this we're kind of thinking about that. And if there are any deviations, they're suggesting we report it, you know, to management, who's ultimately accountable anyway. Okay. And, see, and of course this is interesting, provision should be made to ensure adequate resources are available to host change management software as well as standardized images and making sure we have what we need to, you know, do this verification, have the equipment we need things like that. And some change management tools require client install, while others require significant bandwidth. We must at least consider that. 
and realize what we do, there's generally going to be some sort of effect from that. And when you get through all 20 controls, you kind of look back at this and go, you know, if I had to write a list of what would be good ideas, I probably would have written this list. Because it really is spot on. And, and you know, you first think about it, maybe you can't think of all things that you should consider, but you end up just kind of methodically hitting all the different areas. And you go, okay, yes, that makes sense. So kind of reviewing what we've looked at here. We started out with the inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices, so we're concentrating on devices. Then we kind of shifted it to software, hardware than software, authorized and unauthorized software. And we did control three, secure configuration for the hardware and software, whether it be a laptop workstation or server. And that's, that's kind of the, so the rationale we already did that one. Okay, and of course you can see, just kind of methodically goes down and, and it hits a lot of different areas. Okay, top 20, we basically done three, you know, three of the controls. Okay. All right, are there any questions? Anything you want to look at, talk about before we take a little close enough to take a little break and we will shift subjects to... Uh, basically the pen testing, the CPTE will be our next section. If I happen to have not read your chat window properly and didn't say something or respond, let me know. Any questions on this? Okay. And I need a good sound effect on there. <laughs> I can hear your chats. All right, but yeah, it was, it was just so fascinating when, you know, we were just kind of talking about that, how programmers leave back doors in systems, and then the guy in class went, you know, what about Superfish and Lenovo, and they got in trouble for this. So <laughs> there's all this, uh, fix, all these fixes out there. Yeah, I think they do, too. You guys, you, call, you guys can all see these comments. They probably do. I mean... I think they probably do it in the name of, oh, look at this nice little software. I mean, it's probably multiple reasons. I mean, part of it is, yes, they do have a back door, and I think the true intention was to be able to get into your system and help you. Yes. But then where the get in trouble is you not knowing that, them not telling you that up front. You could make that decision. Of that Because it makes you always wonder if it's happening when you don't know it's happening. That's a little disheartening. And, and we can't just say, let's go pick a Lenovo today. That's just the one I, <laughs> I heard about, you know. But we, we know it's, it's there. I mean, they seem to always have the little fleet of software. My, this thing's got some software behind the scenes. It's not so an, announced as my Lenovo. I own a Lenovo, too. But it's definitely there. Okay. All right. If you have no questions, we're going to go ahead and take about a five, six-minute break here. We're going to switch subjects again to the pen testing. So if you have another book you want to switch to, do so. And you guys take you a five-minute break or so. Five, six minutes. And I will see you soon. Okay. Enjoy your break. Get up, move around. You'll feel better. Oh, yeah. On your systems, if you could, uh, if you're not talking, go ahead and mute yourself. Because what it causes is some background noise. I tried to go through and mute anybody I saw I thought might it might be coming from. I found the button. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, so I, it looks like I may have had the power to do that. So I muted everyone. If you happen to want to just talk out loud, if you have something to say like that, just feel free to unmute yourself for that time period and then just re-mute when you're done. You also have the chat window to work with. Uh, we are looking at CPTE. Okay. And we're going to get a little portion of this done as well. Okay. All right. Has anybody started the CPTE? Has anybody started that class? Okay. You'll like it. 
you will like it. Okay. All right. So this is where, you know, you guys have been doing a variety of classes, I'm sure. I've been hearing like CSS, CVA, CISO, you know, top 20, all really good courses, but not really hands-on yet. I don't know if anybody's done CPEH. I don't know exactly which ones you guys are doing anyway. There's also one called, uh, this, um, kind of like called we call it Ethical Hacker, but CPEH, and then the, the one above it is this, CPTE. And you, again, I'm not sure which ones you will do of these, but when you get into CPEH, CPTE, this one, uh, those are hands-on. That's your big difference, okay? Now, some of this intro section here may not be really necessary. I just wanted to see if there was anything in this that we need to look at. Because when you get your kit, you will get a workbook, a lab guide, DVD, and, you know, things like that. You should get a t-shirt, and you should get, like, something you cover up your webcam with. Okay? I'm just going to pull these up. And just kind of give you an idea where you, when you get to that course, what you'll get to do. And we're going to obviously get to kind of start some of it in this session. And very hands-on oriented course. There's, a, there's some Linux chapters, two Linux chapters in it. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, but I don't do Linux. I'm more of a Windows person, too, if that's your situation. But at the same time, you're not necessarily trying to become a Linux expert here. You're only using the Linux for you know, some of your hands-on, and you'll find that the lab manual will take you through kind of what to type, and we'll get the basic network fundamentals, so we'll be able to, you know, get, at least get started, get, make sure we have an IP address, and we communicate, and then we can go on from there. And it's not going to be that complicated, is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, and you're going to find, even if you're not someone who really likes Linux, realize that it's, it's very doable and it's very powerful. Uh, if we thought Windows could do a better job on being the attacking system to do the vulnerability assessment pen testing, we would have chosen it. But I think you're going to find um, that we're going to end up using a tool, uh, you know, when you, get, when you do that course, and I'm just basically giving you kind of where the, now we take you through kind of a review of some of the topics, and in the course you'll actually do the hands-on. But the Kali Linux is actually the name of the distribution we use now. The predecessor was called Backtrack Linux, okay? And they're very similar. If, if I went out and bought a Backtrack Linux book, it would be quite suitable for my Kali Linux. It's not a problem. So we're not, like, emphasizing in the book so much, but you're going to see a lot of labs that use Linux. But, yeah, there's quite a few that use Windows, too, so it's good to be flexible. So we'll look at that, understand pen testing, information, and uh, links fundamentals, information gathering, detecting your live systems, enumeration, learning more, reconnaissance, automated vulnerability assessment, looking at your malware, assessing and hacking windows. Okay. Get these all up. And then assessing and hacking Unix Linux, advanced assessment exploit, Leakage analysis of wireless, kind of talking about wireless, network sniffing IDS, assessing hacking databases, and web technologies, and report writing. Because at the end of the whole thing, it's kind of expected that, you know, in real life, we would have a report to write. Although there's plenty of, you know, if you Google about vulnerability assessment, penetration testing reports, there's plenty out there to give you examples, plus we have a chapter on it. So kind of a neat area. And, you know, the idea is to get, you know, kind of understanding of, Penetration testing, which is effectively ethical hacking kind of thing that you're doing. And, and with anything, the more you practice, the better you'll get. It's real simple. There's a test that goes with it. Most, well, you guys, some of the tests you've been taking have not been quite like this. Just slip past it. Usually it's 100 questions, 2 hours, 70% passing. Now, some of the smaller classes, I forget which ones are which. It might be top 20, it might be uh, CSS. It's some of the smaller two, three-day classes don't have this, the same quantity, there's less questions and shorter duration and things like that. There's just a few that are like that though. Now when you actually take the course and everything, uh, you're, you guys I guess will be doing some of the online stuff especially too. You know there's videos to go with it and hands-on in the actual lab guide plus there's hands-on on the videos uh, as far as the chapters, going through the chapters. 
So it's got oh, the lab manual is pretty extensive. So I'm just trying to give you a, a prep. Now this is what they think that your so-called prerequisites would be. I mean, if you understand TCP/IP, you are better off. If you understand a little bit about computers, a little bit about Microsoft. You know, the more you know, it's always better. But if you don't really have to know Linux to get by. If you know a little bit, it kind of helps, but don't let it scare you off. Okay. So just want to give you kind of a tour of where you, what you're expecting. This is probably one of the best classes, really. I think it is. Okay. Business and technical logistics for pen testing. Okay. So we're just trying to get an idea. This is kind of our overview. Oh, and I could read all of them, but basically all about pen testing and, you know, get an idea of security and what it's costing people and the threats that are out there. And, you know, so kind of the terminology, the tools, and, and so on. So just kind of go through this. So let's get that over just a little bit. Okay. All right. So when we think about a penetration test, I mean, you are running through, and you're doing a couple things. I mean, you, you are looking at vulnerabilities, and the part that makes it a penetration test instead of just a vulnerability assessment is the fact that you're playing hacker, except with a lot of restraint. You're actually trying to uh, simulate what a hacker would do within reason. Okay. You're not going to go recklessly and just destroy their systems like maybe a malicious hacker would, but you're, you're going to sort of simulate some of the tactics that they would do, some of the exploits, some, whether it be you know, technical exploits that you do with, you know, by typing on the keyboard versus uh, something they might do through a you know, social engineering over the phone or through uh, you know, an email phishing attempts or a physical attack. So you're just really diligently working through looking at the target, trying to figure out what the system's weaknesses are, and we call those weaknesses vulnerabilities. Okay. So you know what they're really the reason you're hired to do this is they they need to know what their problems are. Except you're the good guy, you're being paid to do these things. <laughs> so they figure you're not going to try to just destroy them. A hacker might be willing to destroy the company, they don't really care. They want to, you know steal, do whatever they need to do, potentially, but a pen tester, you just want to know what, where the weaknesses are so you can, you know, eventually get a report together and says, this is what we found, these are most critical, this is what I recommend, that kind of thing. You're trying to help them out, okay, that's, that's the idea, okay, and if I don't notice something important in the chat window, you just let me know, okay, I do have it off kind of the side, I'm just not looking at it quite as closely. So I mean, there's a lot of benefits. I mean, you got to know what your problems are so you can manage them. You don't want to have downtime because you don't even have a clue that you have weak, weak, a lot of weaknesses. Maybe you're in a particular industry that has regulations that you must follow, and if you don't follow, you could be paying fines, like HIPAA. You, you'd like to not have some incident that affects your you know, image with the customers and so on. And maybe if you're going to do cybersecurity insurance, it's got to show that you're, doing, you're being very diligent and finding out what your weaknesses are and trying to do something about it instead of just pretending they don't exist. Okay. So yeah, when you can have data breach insurance and you know that can obviously that costs money, any sort of insurance costs money. So and you know that's a possibility. Moving further, um, since I'm going to try not make this a full blown class, but more of just kind of going through some of the topics. Uh, recent attacks and security breaches, I mean, you would have this in your CPT ebook when you get this and everything. And it's, it's really quite interesting that, you know, some of these websites, as you go to them, you will find that they talk a lot about, you know, what's been happening in security, kind of like giving you the current news on security. And I'm not sure if I can see that. No, it's not set up to link. But the... You know, you can go to these, look at attacks, breaches, pen test magazine, computer world, looking at their security topics, distributed denial of service, they show what's going on with denial of service. So these are just examples you can kind of go out to sometime and sort of take a look at and keep you kind of keep yourself kind of up to date. And as far as what a hack costs you, I mean it's really tough to put a figure on that. What I'm always afraid of with when you hear a company's been hacked is the reputation loss that they've experienced. I mean I wonder, it'd be interesting to see you know, how much, like, Target was affected. 
when there was those, all these credit cards were disclosed. I don't know if anybody's tried to follow that. But it, I'm sure they were affected. I mean, I know I didn't show up for a couple months, and that was out of character. Because, <laughs> you know, it was inconvenient. It's like, I have to bring up cash? I don't do that. I want credit. I don't trust you yet, so I'm not going to show up until I think you've got it together. You know, that kind of thing. There's that paranoia that maybe we're having. But, you know, it does definitely affect their reputation. And, you know, companies out there losing, like, our customer data. There's all kinds of losses that can be experienced. Okay. And it's kind of showing, you know, year after year, it just kind of goes up. And, you know, what they lose. And, you know, as far as the evolving threat and everything, I mean, but you have people of different skill level from the script kitty on up to the expert. And then you have the, you know, why they do it. <laughs> I'm just curious or I want to be famous, personal gain, natural, national interest, whatever it happens to be. Okay. Yeah, there's kind of visualizing that slide set. Yeah, and there could actually be, you know, very organized, like, mafia-style crime, if you really think about it, with this. Now, this is a very fascinating one. I always like this slide, okay, because it shows, you can show how when the product ships, then the vulnerability is discovered, then components modified, then the patch is released. Then there's that delay. When does a patch get around actually being put on the customer's system? And that's that's the reality. Has anybody got any figures you can put in the chat window of what you've heard out there? How many how many days do you think it is? Do you think it's a 30-day delay, a 60-day delay? It's a completely different number. What have you heard, if anything? Feel free for some input. Okay. Yeah, I've heard 30-day, uh, that seems like that's pretty common, it's as much as 60, and that was mind-boggling, too. So you can imagine. So think about it. I mean, there's a vulnerability. Hackers have an exploit. But gosh, we don't put the patch on there to fix that little problem because we wait. And why do we wait? Because we want to test it. We're afraid, and I've heard companies say this, we're afraid to put those patches on there because we're, like, working right now, and we put the patch on, we might not be working anymore because maybe there's a conflict with some other piece of software we have on there. You know, it's, it's very important that we get patched quickly, but it's very important we also test the patching, so maybe we should put additional time in that and be a little more aggressive with this. Okay, so that's because that's a big thing. And think about this, if, if there were a patch put out there that was discovered, then maybe the hacker doesn't know what you're patching, and they may try to reverse engineer it and figure out what it did. So... You know, days between patch and exploit, I mean, see, it takes about two hours for patch to be reverse engineered. So it's, it's, it's a serious area. Now, we start thinking about, uh, they call them zombies. You've got a computer attached to the Internet that's been compromised by a hacker, a computer virus, or a Trojan horse program. You're being controlled. That's why they call it a zombie. Okay? And it's you and many others. It's not like that one system. You're just many in the army, you might say. And they're being used for, you know, different tasks. I mean, it could be, the picture shows pretty good, like spamming, virus trojans, uh, doing something with, wet with uh, email. I mean, it could be uh, distributed in all service, something you're being used for. So you form this collection of systems, you zombie systems become part of a big network being told what to do. And I guess let's get the word bot or robot. So a collection of computers connected to the internet that are, that are put together to do some task. And I was just giving you some examples of task. Okay. And you know we really have to watch our systems because we had to have been infected with some sort of software to be controlled. And I think people just don't realize they've been infected. Maybe they just don't have anything on their system that even watches for it. So, so it, can, it can really spread. As this other terms I use, for it to form and grow, it must accumulate drones, and each drone must be individually exploited, infected, and assimilated. It sounds like something from Star Trek. Okay, 
And for this reason, most bot software contains spreaders that automate the task of scanning IP addresses for vulnerable software holes so they can basically infect. You know, that's really what it comes down to. And here, they're just kind of showing, you know, you can actually kind of look at this if you wanted to, but there's actually a group called Shadow Server. And they're, all, they're, all, they're trying to be good. Okay, they're trying to do something good for us. They're not evil. <laughs> oh, a volunteer watchdog group of security professionals that gather, track, report on malware, botnet activity, and electronic fraud. So it's, it's really to help. It's to improve the security of the Internet by raising awareness. So there are good organizations out there. You know, and really with botnets, I mean, you saw there was a lot of emphasis on scanning and what scanning technique you use. I mean, that's one of them, idle scan. And, and I think they can really depend on that user behavior. I mean, you can depend on users just to do all kinds of reckless things if we don't control what they do. Hopefully in your workplace, you control a lot of what they do uh, by maybe group policy. Uh, what was discussed um, was it software restrictions, now called app locker where you can spell out this is what you're allowed to run and nothing else. So just kind of, and well beyond that, group policy, just be strict with them and don't give them too much freedom. Okay. All right. And then you think about pen testing. So you're being hired to pen test. And how much knowledge do they give you when you're being hired to do this? Now, if you're kind of in the dark on it, they don't tell you much of anything. It's called black box testing. It assumes no prior knowledge of, of really the network. And you gotta have to figure things out. You know, they're I guess they're going for the perspective of if it was an outside hacker, they wouldn't exactly have schematics and details on your network. They would be in the dark. And so, so we're kind of simulating what an outside hacker was not knowing much about us at all and what they'd have to go through, what experiences they would go through. Then if you go and just give them everything when they do their pen test, and say, let's tell you everything we can tell you, white box. Provide the tester with complete knowledge of the, of the company, the environment, the infrastructure, diagrams, source codes, if you have any source code to get to, IP addressing. So, you know, maybe typical knowledge, perhaps, that an insider would have, but everything they could possibly offer, they, they do with this white box. Then there's also you know, gray box testing too. And that would be somewhere in the middle, pretty straightforward. Now most books you look at on hacker methodology, they're I mean, you're pretty close to this. I mean, they may vary the names ever so slightly, but in the beginning you, you do your information gathering. We call that reconnaissance. Okay, intelligence work by obtaining information, uh, whether you do it passively by simple sniffing and eavesdropping or more actively where you interact with the client, which it might be through the internet, doing who is lookups, and you can do people lookups and get a lot of information too. Then there's scanning. And when you do scanning, I'm kind of thinking of port scanning. And sometimes they call them ping sweeps, but you could actually use something like a tool called Nmap, which you will be looking at at some point. And you actually do a scan perhaps of a, you know, a particular subnet or whole network and see what systems are up by their IP address and what they're running. Gaining access. Now, before you do that, I mean, I've seen some books say reconnaissance or footprinting, scanning, enumeration, but you're still just sort of expanding as you go through these first couple steps. And then finally, you have to find, have found enough to gain access. And you exploit any vulnerabilities that you think you've located to see if you can punch past it and get into the system. Then once you're in, the way you've got in may not always work for you in the future. It may, who knows, the client might fix it. They might fix the problem and patch it. So you might try to upload your own malicious software with the whole concept of coming back in. Probably a Trojan horse program. And what you've done, what you're going to do, uh, you know, you've got the maintaining access, so you can kind of come back as you need to, the uh, covering your tracks. And that's not unusual to go look at your logs on that computer and try to, uh, you know, make changes, delete the whole thing, or perhaps just delete selective entries of the log. That might be better. <laughs> and that way, not really have any paper trail spelling out, you know, what you've been up to. Okay. 
Now here, there's kind of varying it just ever so slightly. I just want to get the whole thing up. There we go. So you know, penetration tester. I mean, it's very similar. I mean, we're just kind of looking at the. the it's just kind of the naming, just ever so slightly different. But with the pen tester, you do have some ethics. <laughs> and you still have the foot, footprinting where you're gathering the information. You still have the scanning. Well, they actually didn't use the word footprinting on the last slide. They used the word reconnaissance. But footprinting, information gathering, scanning, enumeration. This is all about information gathering, essentially, and trying to get very, you know, get specifics about the different operating systems. And then basically, you know, because you're a pen tester, you're not so much worried about creating a back door to come back later because you, you have the right to be there. You have a written, you know, contract or something that says you have the right to be there. So when you try to break in, if you, you know, you try different tactics to break in and then maybe see if you're successful versus if you can't break in, you could see if you can get anywhere with a denial of service. And with the denial of service, I guess that the theory is you might could uh, you know bring that system down. You might find yourself in a place on that system that you wouldn't have normally been that you could then go forward with. But yeah, the more skilled hacker is going to go to the right uh, penetration test that's successful, and they'll do you know elevate the privileges from a regular user to a higher user, make changes of the data, cover their tracks, you know leave back doors as necessary. This is a reading thing. Uh, it's not, so I'm not going to, because of the format we're using, we're not doing like a standard course, we're just doing kind of a review thing. Um, I'm not going to jump out and you know, look at all these, but I just want you to see that there are different methodologies. It could be an interesting read if you Google these. And I always really like, I always like the open source security testing methodology one. That's pretty good. But any of these special publications that NIST puts out, those are, those are quite informative especially like those. This one's the 800-115 Guidelines on Information Security Testing. There is a difference between a hacker and a pen tester. Okay, Remember the pen tester is the good guy <laughs> and has great constraint and uh, basically uh, has a set of rules they must follow and things like that. Versus the hacker, they don't do anything they feel like because they don't really care about, I mean, they wouldn't be hacking your system if they cared about you. So they may not really care about the target. So they have their reasoning. Maybe they think they're going to make a lot of money. Maybe they think that what you do at your company is completely terrible and unethical. So they feel whatever they have to do to bring you down, they have justification. So, you know, a hacker will just get in your system and they're just kind of ruthless would be the idea. We tend to call these black hats. Our bad guys. Versus a pen tester, you're only doing what you're doing because you got written permission. And even hired to do so. So, and that's the one interesting thing too. A pen tester wants to log what's happening for record's sake and a hacker doesn't want to be have any logging going on at all because that will tell people what they're doing. And you are going to show up with a report at the end. That was the whole idea. You get hired to look into it, and they want to see that report. What did you find? What are our problems? We want to know. So, you know, you're hired as a, as a good guy when you're a pen tester. A fancy word for pen tester might be ethical hacker. Okay, it's like an ethical side. Now, there are a lot of nice tools to make things easier. But at the same time, realize that you need to be able to think literally outside the box on this one. You don't, if you've got somebody that can only run tools, probably don't want to hire them. Okay? You want to be more creative than that because the, the pre-canned tools that you'll learn about in this class that you, you would get, they may not be, they may not catch everything. And you just need to have some skill also to go with these tools. They're not a complete solution necessarily, but they are quite helpful. Okay, just more websites. I'm not going to jump out and look at these. You might find them tools, them useful to be useful tools. I like SecTools.org. That's a really nice one. It shows you like your top hacking tools by category, and they, they like do a survey periodically. Um, security wizardry. I mean, it's a computer world. We've seen some of these and more. Just kind of to check out. 
um, you know, the cve.mytree.org, uh, you'll find a lot of the vulnerability assessment programs will come back with the vulnerability and give you a special identifying number called a CVE. And the common vulnerabilities and exposures number can be cross, you know, can be increasingly correlated uh, between what you see on the vulnerability assessment report from the tools, and you can see if there's any exploits that deal with that or anything to improve and patch the system even better by you just it's just good information. They've identified the vulnerability and given it a special numeric identification number, and that's the CVE. A lot of your programs follow that. They do vulnerability assessments. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and so there, there's just all kinds of examples of tools. I don't think that one's that particularly important. Here's SANS Institute, and they're just kind of showing off. I don't necessarily need to read all of them, but see that they're the seven management errors. And you look at these and you go, yeah, kind of makes sense to me. Pretending the problem will go away. Always love that one. <laughs> You know, and I think I saw a comment there, just reacting, always being reactive. Short-term fixes, we don't really fix it in the long term. Fill in to realize how much money your information is worth. You have to think, sometimes think, what would other people pay for it? You know, maybe rely on just certain security products and not really, you know, doing what I might call defense in depth. And, you know, just a lot of just failings that we're seeing here, you know, failing to deal with with the operational aspects of security, make a few fixes and then not allow the follow-through necessary to ensure that it stays fixed. Again, I call that cutting corners. <laughs> Failing to understand the relationship of information security to business problem and how important it really is. And assigning untrained people to maintain security and not teaching them how to do so. Oh gosh, that is so common. I mean, I don't know if you run into that, but it seems like Businesses will tell people, you're going to do this job, and then I talk to the people, and they go, I don't know how to do this job. They've never taught me anything. They just said, you're the computer guy. I've heard so many like that. It's like, well, they heard I knew a little bit about computers, so I'm the sysadmin now. You know, but they don't take the time to train them. And that's just a, how do you expect it to be do, done really well if you've never taught them anything, and they don't, they don't come and knowing it. So, I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, possibilities of what can happen, you know, with us. And this is just meant to be kind of a little, a little introduction to what's out there. Okay. So understanding the threat, understanding pen testing, so the tools. So we're going to see more about the tools later. That wasn't so emphasized in here. And really that it can cost you a lot of money by not doing something. I guess we'll do this one. Here's the next one. <laughs> I'm just going to get the gist. This is a very lightweight one. This actually may be kind of appropriate. All right. So I'm just curious. Is anybody really a Linux type person or are you, are you more Windows? Just let me know. I'm just curious. If you have a preference, that probably tells me a little bit. Okay. Just feel free, um, you know, to throw some dialogue there. Does anybody prefer Linux over Windows? I mean, if your favorite operating system, do you, does anybody actually prefer Linux or you prefer Windows? Okay. Prefer Linux, huh? Okay. I will tell you some of the main people that teach from all two, well, some of the ones I've spoken to, um, they just love Linux. <laughs> Yeah, if you know Unix, you'll learn Linux. That's fine. So we've got a little variety here. You know, I prefer Windows, and but I respect Linux completely. I know that if I'm going to do this, you know, pen testing, vulnerability assessment, I'm going to pretty much park myself in Linux. Okay, I accept that because I know it's a better tool. In my in my opinion, I know it's a better tool. But as I said, some of the the people that I've trained with. They, um, I know some of them, but they actually boot off of Linux, so they, they tolerate Windows. That's their attitude. <laughs> so it's kind of a different thing. And I, I like Windows, and I'd say I more than tolerate Linux. Linux is good. It has its place. And, you know, you can have the best of both worlds. You can actually virtualize it. 
Yeah, because so perhaps, I mean, if I was to speculate only opinion, I mean, I, we're talking about our preferences here. I prefer Linux as a strong server. Um, would I be able to be the administrator of it? No, let's get somebody else. But do I think it's stronger? I personally think it's stronger. But when it comes to, you know, your own system, your own personal system that you use, Windows does seem, in my opinion, a little friendlier. I mean, it does seem, you know, helpful and easy to get along with. You know, that kind of thing. So, you know, the, the beauty of it is we can have it all. <laughs> we can boot off of either one and still have the opposing operating system. What we do a lot in classes is we'll virtualize. Okay? We'll actually virtualize and, and have, you know, Linux and Windows, you know, different versions of Windows, servers for Windows, anything we want. So we're going to get just the basics. There's not going to be a lot on Linux, except these are just the basics. There's going to be one more chapter that kind of touches on it a, a bit. So just want to get kind of the core knowledge. And you hear these words out there, and it does go back a ways, and it has actually changed a lot, too. So look at memory management. We're going back pretty far on computers. <laughs> the 386s, some of us remember back even further. And then so essentially... You know, so going back to a uh, rudimentary kernel that had passed as a source text to others who were interested via the Internet. So, and then as we progressed, <laughs> you started hearing, uh, like, good news, not Unix. Good news is how you pronounce it, actually. And, you know, we started, people that were used to Unix were probably worse, used to a, a command line operating system. And they started creating these uh, variations, uh, kind of what we were used to as, Unix, and we call it, started calling it Linux. And then when you hear someone, if you talk to someone and say, I like Linux, then you could get this long conversation on which Linux version they like. What flavor do you like? And there's, there's a ton of them out there. Does anybody have Linux running on your home, one of your home machines? Or maybe even in a dual boot situation? Okay, good. So you guys are hands-on types. Okay. CentOS, VMware, Linux. Okay, so I get a feel there. I have Linux running on this machine under VMware. Yeah, and I put Ubuntu Linux on my father's machine uh, because I read it was supposed to be user-friendly. <laughs> and he, he's one of those that still has a machine with XP on it. So what I did is a solution. Is I left XP on there, but I turned off the internet access. And then I, I tried to install Windows 7, but it just blew up on there. It just didn't work. Found out later the specs were wrong. It wasn't up to par. But so they ended up putting, um, you know, I tried to find a user friendly Linux edition, and the Ubuntu seemed pretty decent. So it, it's simple enough that it can do easy things like go out and do Facebook and check email and surf the internet, okay? And do a couple of things like that. But, and then, you know, hold on the backwards compatibility of XP, for example, if he wants to do, you know, some little things that older people might like to do, like Family Tree Maker and, and do, you know, birthday cards and such. You know, so you can, what's neat about Linux is you can put it on a machine that is really, really ancient. I'm trying to remember, it might have 512 mega RAM if it's, if it's lucky. I mean, it was, it's a pretty low-end machine, this particular desktop. But, you know what, Linux was happy to go on it, okay? And there's just a ton of flavors of Linux out there. <laughs> and now I should really. Um, yeah, I own a Mac also. Those are great too. Very user friendly. And, you know, they've got these opinions here. I don't know if I completely buy all this. Some believe it's the most attacked operating system due to its availability of the source code. I don't really completely buy that. But, you know, with anything, you could say if it's got. Um, if you actually have something that's open source, then in theory more people are involved in trying to keep it, you know, as a good, good sturdy system. Love how so many different thoughts and opinions on these systems. It's, 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 it's very interesting, though. And that's why I'm so glad we have a variety to work with. Because, you know, some people say I want. The people that use the Macs, by the way, it is kind of a Unix base behind the scenes. They just don't realize it because it's graphical. Now, is Linux graphical? It can be. Oh yeah. Um, when you use a CP, when you do their, your um, hacking class, CPTE with us, well, I'm assuming you're taking that. Um, when you do that, will it be graphical? 
you won't notice it as graphical. You're going to mostly be at the command line. It's got some drop-down menus, but you usually end up landing on a command, on a, you know, to a, a command window anyway, so you might as well just stay there for the most part. Now, as far as, you know, some that they're showing off here, I mean, there's different desktops, graphical user interface desktops they have here. I mean, there's a KDE. They just have different looks. Okay, they have a GNOME. I mean, they mentioned another called Fluxbox. I mean, there's a different, like, interfaces, and people have very different preferences, and they are pretty similar with the different flavors, but if you ever start installing, you know, products, the methods sometimes vary based on what flavor, what general flavors you have, okay? Now, Linux works in a, they don't call it a command prompt, they call it a shell, okay? But it feels sort of like a command prompt. Your slashes, where you normally go backslash to change into a different directory, you do forward slash. You, it is case sensitive. That matters. You could type in the right file name, but if you don't do it in the right case, as an uppercase, lowercase, it's not going to work. Okay. There's there's a lot of customization for those that actually want to do customization with it, and of course, they're actually saying Bash is a Unix command shell written for a GNU project, born again shell, a pun on born shell. Okay. So there's been a lot out there, a lot of commands, okay? And of course, uh, who am I? You can do that and find out who you're logged in as at that moment. There are some nice tool uh, books you can get on Linux. If you just kind of get want to get right to the point. And I have a pocket guide. I like that one. It's kind of right to the point. And I'll say there's one in a nutshell. But there's many out there. I like to read, serve, read what people say on like Amazon or something and see what they think of it. I'll jump out just for seconds. Here we are. Okay, I got it. So um, with this, there are two files that are of importance here. You got a passwt and a shadow file. And when you look at the passwd file, you actually see the users, um, you know, the users that are on there. But there will actually be another file where the pass, where the actual passwords are written, and they're written in a hashed format. And the file is called the shadow file. Now, we don't really do the dir command for directory. Not, maybe some of you aren't even used to living in a sort of a command window. But with this, we do, some, we do a fair amount at a command window. And uh, we just do ls instead of dir. Okay? And that gives us the listing. And you're going to see some more details here. So if we were looking at, and it's in a folder called etc, etsy, and if we were looking and then we saw this file called passwd, we would actually see the usernames and, and there's a whole lot of you know, details that we have beyond that and home folders and things like that. But the little X that you see, if you see an X, which you should see an X when you're looking at the Etsy password file, that X means that there actually is another file called shadow where they'll have literally what the password is, except it won't be readable. It'll be hashed. Okay. So that's the idea. Linux, in summary, Linux systems have a shadow and a password, passwd file. And the passwd file will generally have the user accounts, their home directories, and in particular, like that. And they'll have like an X, which means refer to with the Etsy shadow file to find the exact password, which is stored in a more secure format. Uh, and you can see like this J Smith here. You can go see J Smith's password, except it's hashed. Okay. And here is just kind of showing it. There is a little tool you could pull down called Nano. Now, whether you're using Backtrack or whether you're using Kali, I may have grabbed the wrong slide set, but they're really not different enough to really be an issue here. But you know, you can use both the Nano command. It will be no different whether you're in Backtrack or Kali. Now, which one would you prefer? Well, if you go out there and look for Backtrack, they're going to tell you to go get Kali. So you're not going to get Backtrack for the most part unless you already had it. There's no reason to go back to backtrack, but if you have it, it's not going to harm you because the command structure is practically identical. Okay, so I could do this very same thing on either. I just have to have the nano. If I wanted to do this technique, I'd have to have the nano tool installed, and then I guess it's kind of like the old, maybe dating myself, uh, maybe the old edit command, <laughs> or maybe you could use like almost like do a Notepad space, you know, Etsy pass WD except it's called Nano. Once that's installed, it's just a nicer, friendly environment. 
and you look there, and that's what it, the file would look like. You can see it's got names, the root account, which is the most powerful. They're not really showing you a lot in here, but you could have way more um, user accounts listed here. And then when you see the little X, you know to look in the shadow file, nano space et forward slash etc forward slash shadow, and you get to actually see the user accounts, and you should normally see the actual contents of it. And of course, um, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and use this for now. But all you do is you go to the command line with this and you just say add user space and you make up their name. And you hit enter. And it's going to ask you questions. You know, if you want to, you know, like little extras here, and they keep going with it, put in a password. And then they might ask you things like your name, room number, work, num work phone, et cetera, anything you want to put in there. And just, and yes, is it correct? Yes, enter. So it's really very simple. It's just add user space and the name of it. Now, as far as this class goes, you know, when you're actually doing the hands-on component of this, it's not that we sit around adding users. We don't sit around creating folder structures or anything like super like Linux oriented. We just use the tools that are already there. And what is so special about Kali Linux and the predecessor, Backtrack? There are Linux distributions that have all your great security tools put in place for you so you don't go ha have to hunt them down. That's why we're so thrilled with, with that. Oops. Okay, I'm going to take you out and let you see that. Okay. So if I say backtrack Linux, still got a website. It says, oh, it's no longer being maintained. Go to Kali. And here's Kali. Then I can get documentation on it and all kinds of goodies there. I go to downloads. I can download Kali Linux. I would prefer to do the ISO over the torrent. This doesn't feel right to do the torrent. And, you know, they've got different ones. If you're a 64-bit machine, do the ISO for that. If you're 32-bit, you can do that. It even presents. Look at that. A little integrity check. You're um, hashing. And uh, you don't really have to download and think about whether I'm going to use VMware or VirtualBox. I mean, they do have a link, it looks like, to do VMware images as well as apparently VirtualBox now. But I find it simple enough, we you know, with some direction to, you know, pull this down and go into my VMware workstation and just start creating it. And it will create it right from the ISO. Okay. Make sure I haven't missed anything important. Okay. Okay. So another thing, so you don't you don't actually do a lot of what you're seeing here. It's it's more going to be commands relating to vulnerability assessment, pen testing. So you're not just living in Linux interacting. So make sure to lose lose anything. So we did the add user. Talked about that. And if I've already made the user called Red, then I could say password space Red or Bob or whoever it is and change their password. I can do that with the passwd command. So it's just trying to show off a couple of real basic things. And another thing you'll learn when you're working with the uh, VM is you can do IF config, and that may be super far. And you know, because we used to maybe IP config. Well, in this world, you know, you can spell out what interface you're using, and it will probably be Ethernet zero. But you can do IF config. And you can bring the interface up, you can bring it down, you can even manually spell out what its IP address will be. And if you're going to do some non-default, you can spell out the subnet mask, you can do the default gateway. But at the same time, if you're used to, in a Windows environment, where you just use a DHCP and just let it give you the address, um, this thing's going to go ahead and give you the address anyway. Um, I think you're going to find it. Let me see Okay, will they be retained? Yes. Um, it depends on how you do them. Oops, sorry, I hit the right button again. So I'm not missing notes. Okay. When I do them for through VMware, VMware, they they're retained. Um, and you can actually save save it too. I mean, I usually use a command if I'm having any trouble called DH client. And uh, sometimes I'll do dh client, like I uh, think it's dh client ETH0. 
and it will make sure it tries to make it a DHCP client. But normally, like for the sake, like if I went out there to, to um, Kali Linux and I pulled down an image and I went into this tool called VMware Workstation and I started to create a new virtual machine, then I would go through and do the install and I believe it's going to default to being a DHCP client anyway. And I've never really had any trouble with it remembering. And I can also, it depends on, you know, if you guys are going to do it virtualized. I'm going to tell you what MAL2 will do with you. MAL2 is a big believer in virtualization, which is a really great way to go. Because with virtualization, you can be running your main computer, and then in theory, well, in theory, so as you just run a VMware workstation, then you could put many operating systems on top of that. And you can tell it to save. Now I can go ahead, let me just see where I am on time, and I gotta be careful with this. 15 and 23. Um, you can go into VMware though and tell it to get the wording for you. Basically save it. And okay. And I will tell you my answers are kind of coming from a backtrack Kali perspective. So I could be wrong in some of your other editions. So it depends on the flavor of Linux might be. And you know, the Linux of flavors are, I can't are, are so different. They're so very different. That's so why I'm, I'm going to hesitate going out there. If I get involved in uh, VMware right now, I won't finish the chapter. So um, when you start doing it for the sake of pen testing and you start using the very wonderful Kali Linux, it seems like it remembers. And it's called a snapshot if you're using uh, VMware. And you can tell it to take a snapshot. And if what's beautiful about it is if you mess up, you can revert back to the snapshot. There are certain labs that I've learned I better tell you to do a snapshot in or when you certain activities happen, I might not be able to fix it <laughs> without having them all to put it back together. If I do a snapshot, kind of like, um, you know, in Windows, you can actually, you know, save a point in time or store points. You can just kind of go back. And you can definitely uh, suspend in VMware. You don't have to, and it will remember where you left off too. Okay. So, yeah, it probably varies a lot. I'm kind of... I use Linux for one reason. I want to use it for the pen testing vulnerability assessment. Otherwise, it's not my favorite, but that's just preference. So yeah, I find in class, I don't, we have some labs that have you do this, but for the most part, you're just going to get an automatic address. And when it glitches, I do DH client <laughs> and get it back, you know. Now, in class, we're less likely to have to do this because it seems like backtracking Cali sort of take care of you. But just for, you know, let me go ahead and try to finish this up. Linux does store all its devices in a de slash dev directory. And depending on the type of device, whether it's, you know, IDE or like SCSI, which is less likely, or SATA, you know, will depend on how it's listed. And then some systems, you literally have to mount the device for it to become accessible. And you might, you know, have to actually use a command called mount. And, you know, I found... With, for the sake of doing the vulnerability assessment pen testing subjects like we do, that I don't really have to do this. Now, in standard Linux, it's a possibility with some of the ones out there, but to actually, you know, when you're trying to do the pen testing, it just seems to auto mount. It just doesn't, of course, I don't have any trouble. There's little things I have to tell you about VMware <laughs> if you're trying to get all that to work. You do have to tell just real quick that the USB drive's connected, you got to tell it. That to make use of it. The USB devices cannot belong to the guest and the host at the same time, so you have to tell it which one you want to have. So, you know, some Linux systems you might have to actually mount the device to make it accessible and do these mount points, but uh, like Kali and Backtrack, they don't seem to make you do this. Some system, well, it's not so much so systems, it's some, some out there you would have to actually, um, we, you do some of these commands. I rarely have to do it as far as our classes go, but it, you could run into this. I have run into some where they went quickly, tarball, system that will bundle many files together generally for compression, and you use an untar to untar, basically unbundle, <laughs> if that's a word, a file. You have to, you know, do the tar with certain parameters. It's just kind of an overview. And then, of course, sometimes Linux will even, um, Linux program for compression is called gzip, and you can even have another extension on .gz that can mean 
that it was actually compressed and requires uncompressing, kind of like zip and unzip. And you may even have where they're compressed or so-called zipped and bundled, tarballed together and, and with the right parameters, you may end up having to unbundle and uncompress. <laughs> Is that that's pretty much it. And there are pro some Linux distributions may push you to have to go through a, a more of a lengthy process where they're talking about compiling, you know, they're talking about GCC as a common C compiler. And you may find that some programs you have to go through like a three-step process, configure, make, make, install, dealing with compiling the program. And at the same time, as far as our classes go, with what we do, so many of the tools are already in place. And the, and the few that you have to get, I don't find I have to go through these steps. I haven't found that to be true. Why use a Linux library CD? That's another option. You could just download Kali. I've done it with Backtrack, but not with Kali. Just put it on CD. And I could boot off of that CD or DVD probably, really. And then I could use that, and I get to try it. And I don't have to actually install it unless I like it. Okay. Now, I did actually try that on my father's machine because several Linux distributions sort of fell down. And I was glad I started trying them instead of installing them. Only see they weren't running. So, I mean, it's, it's something nice about booting off of a CD that you're able to uh, do your activities without affecting the system you're on, okay? You know, as far as the typical Linux systems, I mean, you're seeing some popular examples out here. Um, you know, everybody's got their preference, and I've heard a few in the chat window that aren't any listed here because the, the list is huge, okay? <laughs> it's huge. But, you know, Kali Linux has replaced Backtrack, but they're so similar, it's amazing, you know, so similar. They just streamlined it a little bit and pulled out a few commands. It's, it's friendly. It's very friendly once you get used to it, okay? And I'm sorry, yeah, it's, it's obvious I grabbed the older slide deck, but, you know, the concepts are all, all good here. So you're, you're still getting good information. Yeah, we moved on. It's called Kali now. But, um, you know, still, what do they do? They're both all about... Um, the vulnerability pen testing. You know, if you did, you said, I will do Windows only, you're going to have to work a lot harder. You're going to have to go get Windows and go grab a lot of tools <laughs> to do what you have already sitting in, uh, in Linux. Okay? And I mean, when I say Linux, I mean specifically. Now I'll go ahead and try it because if I happen to, hopefully it won't freeze anything up. I can go ahead and do this. My VMware's not been quite as stable since I upgraded. I can probably get one started though. That one might work. Okay, I'll just do the one because I don't want to wait on the systems to load. But basically what it's trying to load here is it's showing off VMware Workstation. It's a product I, I purchased. I thought it was worth it. If you happen to be going to school, which you are, <laughs> or have children in school, you can go search for VMware Workstation um, Education Store, Educational Store, and you will be able to get a way better price, okay, than commercial. The password is Tor, T-O-O-R. It's root spelled backwards. You can see it, was, it remembers where I left off. It does have some graphical tools, as you can see. Um, it does have some drop-down menus. It's got like this shell, IF config, you know, things like that. I've got the print kind of extra big. And, you know, I can do things from there. Uh, even though I can, you know, I can go through here. And, there's, you know, you've got some basic things that are kind of neat and everything. There's a special one called Kali Linux. has a top 10 security tools, and you can go into categories and then subcategories. And it looks all super graphical, but I will tell you, a lot of these are going to end up landing you at a shell anyway. So if you know the name of it, you might as well just do it from the shell. <laughs> and some of these duplicate under these categories. But I just want you to see, there's just a whole lot. There's a big world of tools and some of the sub-tools and things you can do. And so personally, just real quick, I would do Kali Virtualized. Uh, you know, that's the way you're going to find it in the, when you do it in class. You're going to see, I don't have them loaded right now, but you can see I've got when it's 2000 XP and more Kali's, and I just have a few of them that I could start. And just real quick, power, 
I can suspend a guest and just that's why this one started back up so quick because I suspended it and all I had to do is just like revive it and boom it was there and then if I use uh, there's your snapshot option so if I created a snapshot and I messed up at some point I could revert back to the snapshot when it was working before I messed it up and removal devices just real quick this is like a VMware tutorial real quick if I plug in some USB type device that I need to uh, get it to recognize in Kali, I would look for it here and I tell it to connect. So that's just a, that's just a preference on VMware. But you can run Kali, um, you know, on a CD. You could dual, dual dual boot with Kali if you want to. Although I have not personally done that one. Um, so you know, some people might run it on CD, but it will be DVD, but it will be slower. If you don't like VMware, there's a, I'm sure you could do it on VirtualBox. I ran a Mac for hmm, two or three years doing ethical hacking type courses and you know pen testing type courses and all that. And I ran Mac as my main operating system and I ran VMware Fusion and Parallels. I ran both of them. And I was able to virtualize and the, it was Backtrack back then and Windows and all these. And I had my Mac running all these operating systems just like this guy's doing. I was able to run XP. I was able to run, you know, you know, any Windows or Linux or anything I felt like on a Mac. Works on VirtualBox too. Yeah. So, oops, I keep hitting the wrong button. One second, we're about done. I, I took you over right now. Okay, so so basically, as want you to see, there's a whole big world here of things you can do, and, and that's what's going to be the beauty of you, you know, working with um, when you get in the CPTEs, you'll start finally getting the hands-on to play with this, but if you want a safety net, use this. Use some sort of virtualization product like VirtualBox or, or VMware, whatever you want to use. Okay, any questions? No? Okay, well, I hope you guys do well. Uh, I guess that, that, was, that was basically it. We got through uh, two chapters of that for, of the CPTE. And, you know, you can find a lot of YouTube videos on, you know, setting up probably setting up backtrack, I bet you, and, uh, you know, look it on YouTube, set it up, or maybe in a VMware or VirtualBox or whatever it happens to be. People like to share knowledge, so it's out there. So um, let me know if there's any questions. Otherwise, you can have a wonderful long weekend.